Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, we need a little bit for, the, for some board members. They'll be trickling in, but we know that your time is very valuable. So we'll go ahead and get started. Mira? Very good. All yours. So thank you all for being here. Um, today, we always keep our priorities in mind. We're going to talk a little bit about that we make and how operations comes in to support some of those uh, pieces. You're going to hear from human resources, PPS, technology, finance, and the next steps of where we're at with our calendar and just with the district in general. So last month, uh, Mr. Travis and his team presented all of these areas. I'm not going to read them to you, but they're all relevant with the demographic data, the student data. There was some testing, early childhood data. All these things we're going to try to fit in into what uh, how that fits into the budget process that we're about to embark in. Mr. Williams is going to talk to you about how he goes, the process that he follows to identify facilities, how he walks in, he can walk it through from uh, inception to conception. So he's going to go through that process that he follows with his team. Uh, Mr. Greyhouse is going to give you an update of consoles. Right, that's the latest thing that we heard. What's the strategy behind making the selection, and where, what, and where are his next steps moving forward, and how that supports the student assessments that you heard about last month? Uh, Miss uh, Trevino is going to tie in a couple of things about substitute pay. Last month you heard about campus visits, going to visit assembly classrooms. Here's some of the things and how it falls in and how it affects our substitute rates and our substitute uh, need. She's going to talk to you also, you heard a lot about the stipends that we have and what's rolling out next, and also the SEL. That seems to be a really, really hot topic right now, so she's going to talk to you about some of the supports that we've had embedded throughout the year uh, for SEL at the campus level. And then um, finance, Ms. Bramley is going to wrap it up and talk to you a little bit about um, what responsibility. We're about to get into that budget cycle, right? What are the responsibilities and what can you expect over the next few months to include the budget cycle? The um, what parts you're required to report. We're going to go through those pieces again. Last month, you also approved the audit report, that annual comprehensive financial report. So she's going to go over some highlights and some concerns that we have moving forward into next year. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Wickham so he can start us off. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. As Ms. Martinez stated, we want to talk about from concept to completion. I stand on this side. I'm going to get out of your way and go over there. Okay. <laughs> We want to talk about concept of completion, how we uh, look at putting uh, plans together to identify spaces that need renovation or need some touch up. Uh, about five years ago when the, superintendent <coughs> when the superintendent came, he put together a plan with the board of what that might look like and he, and he, and he centered it around a template using what he called the innovation zone, the five innovation zones that we have here. It gets us up uh, until today. So when we look at that, the things that we look at from an operational lens is how we contribute to make the district uh, some of the goals, in particular how we can get to a B or better by, uh, I forgot what year it is, but 2020, 2028, okay, by 2028. So this is our take on how we're helping and supporting that vision, right? So again, about five years ago, we, we came up with the five innovation zones and so I wanted to talk to you about, from, from, from again, the operation lens, how we contribute to uh, prov providing facilities and, and making sure that those facilities match the, the one, the academic uh, piece and supporting that. So when you look at a district, you probably have uh, what we call a uh, facility plan. Uh, maybe about eight years, seven, eight years ago, the district uh, embarked upon a, a facilities plan put together a blue ribbon committee, but 
But normally when you do something like that, it's on a wide scale. It takes in all of the pieces of a district and every facility within that district. Uh, you work with architects, engineers, and you put this and you put a big uh, eclectic uh, group together, board members, community members, students, teachers, uh, and, and some and different staff and administrators. Well, me coming into the district about five years ago, almost five years ago, and looking at the vision of these uh, zones, I saw this plan, or, or went through it just briefly, and I said, okay, this is great. However, we don't have the capacity for a bond right now, and it doesn't look like we're gonna have the capacity for a bond anytime soon. So this elephant, or we don't eat elephant in America, so this cow, I cannot eat this cow and swallow this cow at one in one bite. So how do we now truncate that now so that we can meet the goals of these innovation zones at, uh, from, the, from our operational unit? So what I decided to do, taking from the academic side and my background in academics, we do learning walks and, and put information from the learning walks together, together with a committee of folks walking around observing. So we did, I took that model and said, you know what, we're going to do facility walks. However, we had to do different types of facility walks with different groups of people to make sure we had the information that we need in order to put a plan together on a lower truncated plan or style. So what we did first, identify the campuses that are going into innovation in, in year zero. Once that happened, we did that from the team, uh, from academics and innovation office. Next, we have what we, have, we call maintenance huddles. The maintenance huddles are basically, let me see, y'all see on this page. Well, I'm going to go to the next page. The, the maintenance huddles, and those, and those uh, let me go back, those schools that are identified, of course, we, we're not in year zero anymore, we're like in, in uh, year four. Those are some, those are the schools. But we didn't start with all of those schools in year zero. We started with two. Gardendale, which is not built, and Brentwood, which is now uh, Things. What we think should happen. 
This is from the academic programmatic side. We want to know what you need. And, we're, and we may just ask clarifying questions. We're just writing down whatever you say, right? We take that information back and combine it with those priorities that we said on the infrastructure side. And then now what we do is bring that to a different team, which is the leadership call. <clears throat> and what we talk about doing that huddle are the things that we talked about in that maintenance. We put all that information on the table. Uh, what we talked about in that maintenance huddle, what we talked about in Glean from that innovation walk, and now we talk about the scope, that's what that S stands for, I'm gonna read this acronym out to you. We talk about scope, we talk about the budget, we talk about the timeline to get the work done, and we talk about procurement. Uh, there may be a heavy lead time on certain things. That helps with the timeline, it also helps with the budget, because some of the things, if you want expedited, depends on if it's on expedited price, you know. So we talk about all of this, we put all of that on the table, and then at that point, we make a decision programmatically and uh, what, what needs to take place. Now, to give, give you some examples of once we get to this point, what are some of the things that we may have done or may have been asked for during this time? So when you think about that leadership huddle, and we're talking about the infrastructure pieces, a principal or teachers in a building they just may know that periodically the air is not working and went down, but it kind of routinely goes down. So they know something's wrong with it, but they know we get it back up and running, you know, probably an hour or so. So it's, a, it's a, a nuisance, but they don't know how big a deal it is or how big a problem it is and how much it costs to get maybe a new chiller. And so what we're doing is repairing it, you know, maybe so it can hold up another six months, maybe a year. Those are things that the PBS team know and say, hey, we probably could continue to do this for another two years, you know. Or they might say, sir, it's barely hanging on. We gotta get one. If we don't, it goes down. Uh, we're gonna be in a big, big trouble in dire straits. So that's the type of thing that, again, moves, may, may move the needle on where it goes on that priority list. Okay. Also on the, on the programmatic side, doing that well, just like a room like this room here, we may decide that, hey, this needs to be a hardwired uh, lab because we're gonna have robotics and different types of equipment. So that being the case, now I know I got, we gotta get with technology, we gotta get with PPS on the electrical side, maybe call in a consultant and, and let them look at it. At the same time, they may decide we want this side to be the lab, but on that other side, the next room over, we want that to be uh, the lecture side. So we want you to cut this wall so this can be one larger space, similar to what you have at Brentwood uh, on, the, on the Holster side. Well, before we cut into that wall, we have to think about quite a few things because Holster, if you know, is an older uh, facility. So now, other things come into play. Yeah, we can yeah, we cut it, but we, we structurally, we, we figure that part out. That's one. Well, if we cut into it, again, being an older facility, we have to make sure that we uh, check check for um, make sure it doesn't need a bait could have a best contained contain material in it. So all of these factors go into all of those different pieces when you look at it. So that's sometimes before we bring things to you, we have been working with this in some cases nine months. Right now we're doing and wrapping up uh, our innovation wall. Next early next uh, month uh, January we will now have our leadership up. I present that information to the superintendent and uh, select members of that of that team. Okay, and then hopefully I don't want to put a timeline on myself, but sometime in the spring the board uh, will give an update and then uh, maybe some agenda items that support uh, the work that needs to take place. And so I just I, I jump ahead of myself. Next thing we take that board agenda item. Uh, to the board, hopefully you all uh, get, get a good understanding of where we're trying to go, how it fits into the plan of making us a be or better. We said, okay, that sounds great, elders. It's approved, I go make it happen. It's just that simple, even though it's complicated. That's the joke that I have. Any questions? Yeah, any questions? Very, very thorough. from how 
I'm the one page document. <laughs> this is everything that happens behind the scenes by the time it even makes it to that one page of her rule. And, and it's important that we keep that in mind. You know, try to, to snap your finger and make it work. We, we tried that, it didn't work. It didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. You believe it's too late. Um, that snap your finger approach, <coughs> that's something we do pretty well in technology. We don't need technical tools. Uh, we looked this up yesterday. Um, yeah, so today I want to talk to you about, uh, as, as uh, Ms. Martinez indicated, about Chromebooks and about, you heard a lot last time about assessments and about how we're approaching assessments and why assessments in uh, in the district, and I wanted, I wanted to uh, uh, give you sort of an explanation of, of what we're doing in technology to support a successful um, assessment culture. But first, let's talk about the Chromebook selector. So you may not know <clears throat> that we have actually purchased 5,000 Chromebooks and are in the middle of distributing Chromebooks. Uh, we acquired, let me, let me re make, my, make sure my terms are okay, we acquired 5,000 Chromebooks, and I'll explain that uh, in just a moment. But let me go back to and give you just a little bit of history. In this district, we have historically gone with laptops for students. And at the time when, when that decision was made, it seemed like a, a, like a good one at the time. Uh, laptops are sort of an all-in-one. They certainly will work for, uh, for students um, um, and, and for staff and for everybody. We all use them all the time. But if you'll see them after a year or two, they become quite a, quite a support feature. I call that a feature, it keeps me busy. Um, but we deployed for sixth grade through 12th grade at a price point at that time was of over $1,000 per unit for those deployments. Um, when I came in, I was able to bring that down to about $700, um, a little less <coughs> for, for those devices. But what we needed to do was really find the device that fit the purpose. And so you may have some programs like uh, Career Tech Ed. A lot of those programs do require a mobile device machine. But by and large, our students will be um, better served at a better price point with a Chromebook. So uh, that's what we took into account. Uh, and that's the history that we, have, that we have here in the district of using laptops. So why Chromebooks? Number one, they're they're lightweight, and I don't just mean on a on a, on a uh, weight scale, so to speak. They're they're cloud based. They don't have big hard drives. They don't have they don't need a lot of RAM. Uh, the specs can be fairly low on those devices, and that makes them easy to manage. Um, how many of you have ever done the uh, Windows update that just blew up your machine? Um, I have. We manage that on a regular basis because that's what happens with, with Windows-based machines. Um, Chromebooks, they have a, a default. They'll go right back to a set default um, should the actual operating system get corrupted in some way. Um, so it's very easy to, to manage and maintain. It's also secure. You know, uh, when we have network incidents or threat actors who want to uh, sort of get into our network, it's always Windows-based machines. That is, that is what they target. Um, those, are the, those are the tools that they have available to them uh, to access and, and begin working that route to get into our, our network. So um, Chromebooks are secure out of the box. Uh, the Chrome OS itself is, is not a real hackable uh, kind of operating system. Could it possibly, perhaps, uh, but the incidence of it is so low um, that that's not an issue anymore. That's gonna come up uh, when we talk about cyber cybersecurity posture and, and what we're doing to ensure um, that we are secure uh, out on the endpoints, but that also we're being fiscally responsible with um, the kind of price that that costs, the th threat detection and threat awareness and threat um, security is a costly uh, endeavor uh, these days. And, uh, education is being hit uh, with a lot of Battery life is another one. The laptops, uh, you get really, that first year is your best year on any laptop with a battery. And after that, your battery life tends to decline. And uh, most districts who use, um, who do 
use laptops for their staff if you don't build in battery replacements after about two years, then you're not getting three to five years on that device. So having said that, battery life on a Chromebook is about 12 hours, 12 to 18 hours on a Chromebook. And, and you might ask why that's important. Um, when students, um, when students are taking assessments, I don't want to get ahead of myself. The next, the next slide I'll talk about assessments in Chromebooks and why it's a great, a great choice. Um, the price point for Chromebooks is under $400. Um, so uh, that's an important uh, piece of information as well. Um, we're in the middle of advice refresh, as I stated before. We've got about 5,000 Chromebooks that we are actively deploying to campuses right now to replace laptops. Now the Chromebooks, uh, this is for grade six through 12 right now. The Chromebooks are, um, in this particular purchase were purchased through the Emergency Connectivity Fund. That's what ECF stands for, the Emergency Connectivity Fund. And because the Emergency Connectivity Fund, they, they opened up a window for round three. Uh, you may be aware that in round one, we purchased some uh, laptops and iPads. In round two, we purchased uh, some hotspot um, coverage. And then in round three, I took the opportunity uh, because the uh, ECF will pay up to $400 for a device. All of these devices are under $400, so the district has no, no cost once they approve. So this is, this is basically, basically going to replace our laptop fee uh, in, in secondary. Now, the laptops that we do have will be used. Uh, we have programs like robotics. We have other CTE programs that require a more robust device than Chromebook, and so we will be deploying those devices to those areas as well, and this gives us the opportunity to make sure that core content is covered where a device is concerned, but then also making sure that the, that the arts have devices, that, that virtually every classroom that we have at secondary and for every program has a device of some kind that they can use for, for learning. Um, we are looking to purchase Chromebooks for grades three through five. Um, one of the big uh, Sort of draws for that is all the testing and assessments that we have right now starting this year are all online. And those tests really begin at third grade. And so we want them to have the same device that they might use in secondary at third grade. But then in addition, um, we really want to kick up programs like keyboarding skills. Uh, this, these are important skills uh, these days. I have watched people um, who are professionals in the career, and I don't, I think it's, it's, a, it's an art to watch them use two fingers to type. It is an absolute art. I know people who do this, uh, and they just know where the, where the keys are, and I'm like, I have no clue how to do that with just two fingers. Um, so we want to teach our students how to type, uh, perhaps, um, in a more fluent fashion. Maybe a more standardized way. Um, not that that's any better, necessarily. Okay, <clears throat> let's talk about assessment support. Uh, I'm going to stick with the Chromebook side of this and kind of move over to what we've done at elementary. Uh, Chromebooks support assessments, number one, ease of use. Um, we, during last year, we had some secondary campuses taking their assessments on the laptops. And the laptops at that time, again, we go with battery life. If, if you start, let's say you're starting, it's first thing in the morning and that laptop has been on the charger all night. You're getting at best three hours on that device. Okay. Now, if you're later in the day, there's a cart full of devices that may or may not have be charged, and students having to move between two, three, and four devices uh, as they charge is a distraction. It's a distraction to the assessment, and I don't think that we're going to meet these uh, these goals right here that we have uh, with all of those distractions that that happen because then the student has to log back in to get back into the assessment where they were and then more the, the have you ever been so concentrated on something and then been distracted and then you have to how long does it take for you to get back get your mind back into that thing that you're doing that's the same thing with students and we don't want that distraction to occur so uh, again that battery life that 12 hour battery life uh, we deployed an initial 2005 back in uh, late September, uh, early October, to get them in line for local assessments and for the interim star. And <clears throat> the fact that 
that students don't have to really have a login to the device as a class. You can access the test without the student having a login. The reason that's important, I'm giving you a lot of probably really boring information, but <clears throat> let's say five students don't know their password. Well, now we gotta go through the whole thing before an assessment of making sure our students can have their password to log in. It's not a, it's not a situation with the Chromebook. They don't need their login, they can access the test from in kiosk mode uh, from the device itself, go straight, straight to it before logging in. So ease of use, you know, long battery life, they're not gonna have to uh, switch out and they can access the assessment and we successfully did this um, before Thanksgiving. And, and we're, we're successfully doing it now during end of course, end of course assessments. So again, that's, that is how we're supporting assessments as we move forward and plan and blueprint what devices students would have what's appropriate for them to have. Now, at elementary, historically, where iPads, K through five, right? Got tons of iPads out, out there, and with all assessments being online, when that assessment shows up on the iPad, it takes up real estate. The keyboard, the onboard keyboard that pops up takes up real estate on the iPad. So students have a thinner window. Maybe the item doesn't show all the way and they have to scroll up and down to read the item and read through it. So what we did this year was we purchased um, these wired keyboards that actually cradle the iPad and it being wired, I don't have to worry about Bluetooth not working. As soon as you plug it in, it's accessible to the device and the students have the full screen. It almost looks like a laptop, like even a, a small Chromebook where you've got the keyboard and, and the iPad right there connected. It makes for a much more seamless experience for our students in elementary. So uh, that is how we're supporting assessment uh, right now, and that is the end of my presentation. Do you have any questions for me? Yes, sir. Does that the Chrome will be compatible with a keyboard? The Chrome comes with a keyboard. Comes with a keyboard? This one is specific for the iPads. Yes, the iPads. Yes, sir. Chromebooks don't require like a login password like the Windows? They do to log into them if they're going to use them if, like for Office 365 or for anything else. They don't require a login to take the test. Yeah, so there's a kiosk mode that's down, that's available that accesses the network and allows them to go to the test site um, and be able to use whatever method they use for, for accessing their assessments on. So there's still credentials. I think that's. Oh yeah, there there so are to get in the machine. Yes. yes, I was specifically referencing just the assessment. So but um, it's like the the like um the device gets lost, it's easy for us to take away. Yes. Yeah. We use a uh, a service called Absolute, <laughs> and actually these these will go into uh, another service called Intune as well, uh, and. Um, I'm not sure the functionality of the Google admin panel at this point for doing that. I believe it allows us to push apps, but doesn't allow us really to access and shut it down. But our other tools that we use will allow us to not just do that, but to locate where they are. And you said right now we're at 5,000 on Chromebooks? 5,000 Chromebooks. And we have like a, an enrollment about like, um, like 8,000, right? So Total enrollment. So if you think about enrollment right now, we're talking about 6 through 12th grade. So this will, this in, in my in my calculations, this should take care of all core areas and even more with replacing um, for the with, with replacing the laptops that are out there. We've got two thousand laptops, two of the five thousand. I'm gonna say this wrong, but I got them confused in my head here. We got five thousand total Chromebooks. Okay, two thousand of our laptops are completely in the wind. They are no longer servicing. So this is why we got 2,000 of them up front first at the end of September, so that we could subplant schools that have a vast majority of what we call 3189, 3189s and 3190s. Those are the ones that are end of life. They're, they're, it is an abysmal situation to have to use those uh, for anything. So we want to make sure that we replace those first. That's what we did with, with the initial 2,000. So the rest of them are to help you were talking about keyboarding skills, so I already benefited that in um, learning it in middle school. It is a very valuable skill, and it served me 
throughout my entire career. I don't always type the right thing. I can type, I can always type. <laughs> so, I know that you talked about the Chrome having like its own, they don't, they don't, I guess it doesn't get as many viruses as a laptop would. Right, they don't, they don't get viruses, most of your viruses, I'm sorry, go ahead and ask me. So, with all that we've gone through in the past as far as what happened after long ago, our network versus that uh, security system that talked about Ten million dollars. Yeah, it was something like that. Yeah. Was that a work on Chrome? Was that so? Was it more secure than what we have now? So that is a fantastic question because we are coming up on the anniversary, and, and I'll be talking about this next month. We're coming up on the anniversary of the renewal of our carbon black utility. And what carbon black gives us is endpoint protection, where I, I get <clears throat> I get a notice from this endpoint protection. I'll give you an example happened to us probably two and a half months ago. We got a notice from Carbon Black that a student machine was running a PowerShell script that, that contained virus activity. That was inside the district. And we were able to use our utilities to locate exactly what classroom that was in. And I sent folks over and we declaimed that device and uh, we've gone through it and it wasn't really a threat but if it had been, we would we would have known exactly where that device was. And that's what that endpoint protection gives us. Now, what this allows us to do is it allows us to reduce the amount of licenses we need because we don't need that endpoint protection on there. And so with, by reducing that, I'm gonna be bringing that to less than $50,000 for endpoint protection to cover staff devices and to cover our server environment. So, and I'll talk a little more about that next month, but does that answer your question? Thank you all very much. Thank you. Okay. Well, good afternoon. I know we talked a lot about support, and again, we know, um, I know teacher turnover, actually our profession in general, I know it's a high crisis. I know this morning they kind of talked about it. It's one of the professions that we know has a high turnover, um, and we are seeing it. But I want to give you a report and give you an update. Just a lot of those supportive measures that we've been analyzing as a district and how you have supported those measures and how, um, just to give you a report on how it's impacted, and so we can kind of see where it's at. We'll go over the substitute report, uh, how it was last year, the same time frame and where it is now, um, and just kind of giving you an idea of where we are with our fill rate, and then also the incentives and stipends and how those have benefited um, our employees. Because of course, we're, we're big on recruiting, but how can we retain as well? You know, we wanna make sure that we're retaining and we're retaining the right staff, right? So a lot of those incentives that you have approved have really helped in that area, and I just wanna kind of give you an update on that. And of course, um, the hot topic item that we said that it has been and continues to be, not only for our profession, but just in general, is social emotional support for individuals. We see it for our students, but we're also seeing a lot of that for our staff as well. So I just wanna give you an update on that. So first, our substitute report, as I mentioned, our goal is to recruit and have a high quality teacher in every single classroom. Um, of course, when they, of course, themselves have to be out. We want to make sure that we also have an individual that go in there and support our students while the teacher is out for whatever reason. So that's why it's so important to have a substitute for every single classroom. Last year, we did start the school year with 68 vacancies. So of course, we struggled to make sure that we had a substitute in every single classroom because we were even struggling to entice and recruit substitutes. So when we increased the rate was back in the end of September, when we came to, to you and you approved the rate, um, I'll give you an idea of kind of where we were last year and then where we are now. But it did drastically assist us in making sure that we did have an individual in every single classroom. So the report to tell you last year, 21-22, uh, this is from the beginning of school till the end of November, okay, where we were. So we had a request of 6,527 uh, subs for those three, three months. In those, we had about 6,310 that uh, were needing a substitute. Now you're asking, why do some need a substitute and some not? Well, in some areas we have um, where we cannot have a substitute go into the classroom because it requires a specialized training. Um, like in some of our life skills classrooms, we have to go through special training for our aides if they're gonna change a student. Um, so they have to learn how to use a lift, how to you know, um, make sure they can handle the student. So 
So sometimes those individuals will come in here and they're gonna tell you no substitute needed because the campus will find other individuals that are the backup uh, to go in and make sure that they can support. So the student is supported, but it's supported with individuals that have the specialized training. But they'll go in there and say, I don't need a sub because I don't want the sub to come in. Um, they don't have the, the special training, okay? So that's what that means. This will tell you how many we actually had filled and how many were not filled. So we, out of the request of 6,527, or I should say 6,310, 3,712 were filled. We had 2,598 that were not filled. So it's a pretty large number, but to give you a percentage, we had 57% filled, 40% that were not filled, and 3% that did not need a uh, sub. So we were at about a 57% uh, fill rate. And that's when uh, analyzing the data with school leadership, with academics, and of course, you know, our SLT team, the recommendation came forward to see what we could do to entice and, and uh, elevate the pay for our substitutes. After doing so, now we have, I just wanted to give you, a, you know, apples to apples, not kind of give you the overall last year. So this is where we are now this year. The rates have stayed the same because we have not changed it. Of course we did, I'm happy to report that we did recruit and start the school year with 0% vacancy, right? We had all of our classrooms were filled with a teacher in the classroom. Um, so this year we're at 1,969 requests. And we have filled 1,765, uh, filled were 1,378, not filled were 387. So we were at about a 70% fill rate. So from 57 to 70 with the same time. 20% um, that uh, were not filled and then 10%. So of course what happens, right, when we don't fill a sub? Well, it's normally replaced or um, I guess we get classroom support, maybe that's already there, or if it's a small classroom and they can combine classes, sometimes that happens as well, um, because of course we have to make sure that we have the support. But ultimately that's our last, last, last resort. We wanna make sure that if we can, we have a substitute for the classroom, you know, to make sure that they're getting that, that assistance in there. Um, so that's kind of where we're at right now at 70%. So those uh, fill rates are there. The concern comes in now that um, next semester we are going to be um, asking for, or we have approved already, the perfect attendance, right? So now that we're asking a perfect attendance incentive, we're providing a perfect attendance incentive, the teachers may not be calling in as much, you know? So those individuals that really came out and supported us, these substitutes, when we needed them, what are we going to do for them? We are looking at some uh, at some reports on those that have been consistent with us, those long-term substitutes that have been here with us. And we say long-term, it means that have helped us in 20 or more days, we look at the time frame per semester. If they've been with us 20 or more days, we consider them long-term subs. Normally, a long-term sub after the 10th day, on the 11th day, the rate changes. Okay, they get about 10 to $20 more than they would be getting if they were to not be in a long-term placement. So we always wanna make sure that we're um, taking care of those individuals that did come in and take care of us at the time that we need it. So we are talking to them to see if there's a way that we can have them become maybe permanent employees. Some of those individuals may not meet the qualifications to become a paraprofessional or an instructional aide in the classroom because they have to have the 48 hours of college credit or have taken the treasury and professionals course. We have reached out to Region 20. They have slated us 30 slots, 33 slots. So individuals that want to go in, it's a first come first serve. They offered it, of course, to multiple districts. But if we can get these individuals, if they're interested, they can go take the course free of charge. It's a certification they will have and will qualify them to become a permanent employee of ours. Um, and we have those vacancies right now. We do have quite a bit of paraprofessional vacancies because that's a little bit harder to fill. They don't need a certification, but they do need the credit hours or they'll need this treasury and our professional. So it's just a way I don't want to, um, discount that they were here for us when we needed them. And now with the perfect attendance, we may see our numbers drop even more, which is ultimately what we want, right? Because we want to have our teachers in the classroom with our students. But what are we going to do for those individuals that have been here? Um, so we are trying to find, so just constantly trying to review the data and trying to see what are other ways that we can hopefully take care of those that took care of us, right, when we needed them. So this is where we are with the substitute. I think it's a, it's a good opportunity. Of course, I wish we could be at 90%. Um, but that's not always the case as well because we have had some struggles as well with trying to retain our, our substitutes as well. Yes, sir. I, I want to ask you a question before you move on. Yes, sir. So, this thing's not a dumb question. No, never. But I'm, I'm having a hard time registering with this total passing, passing fee and vacancy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
two and two together. No, of course. This is the D that we have. How many systems do we have? Mm, in the system, oh, we're active about 300. 300. Mm -hmm. So those 300 cover all that? They can. This is, this is total in the three month time frame. Uh -huh. Like we have maybe 20 days, right? Every course, month. Right. Correct. Right. So, and vacancy meaning there are some that, because since the beginning of the year, we have had some teachers leave. Um, some that were retired rehired and some that, I mean, in general, right now we have about 19 uh, positions. We started off at zero, but since then they've left. So just trying to find ways and when they come in, we do the exit interview, but before they even get to that, we're trying to do a lot of that support because it is a lot of our individuals are having some of that sort of emotional support that is in there. You, you answered both of my questions, my, my questions earlier, and I'm trying to figure out how to see what we can do to put them in a permanent position, you know, um, so that they can be with it. And then even once they get to that point, because even some of our substitutes have taken advantage of the teacher working program. Well, what can we do to kind of build them up, you know, to become a paraprofessional, then become a teacher, if that's what they desire. But, you know, supporting them in that way as well. So we're trying every possibility to see. Now, that's, of course, if that's an interest of theirs. It may not be an interest of theirs, uh, but we're trying to see what we can do. So we always want to try and bring them in permanently, um, but we always want to have a good pool of subs to, to fill in the classrooms when needed. Now the perfect attendance, I will say, um, the way it was approved was that the recommendation came forward that if they are to be used for professional development or if they're doing an official school business, like if they're a coach and they're taking a team to a, a tournament, you're still gonna need subs for those types of reasons. So we're still gonna need some subs, we just won't be needing them as much. Um, and if it is something that, you know, maybe teachers, they have the days, maybe that <coughs> has been accumulating, that they're taking more days because maybe it's mentally the need is there. Um, so what can we do to support them? So trying to find different avenues to try and keep them, but then also trying to see what can we do to try and keep our substitutes as well. Um, so just trying to play that balance. I think we'll probably know a little bit more, I would say like February or March, once we've had the perfect attendance incentive, um, start and we can manage and analyze that data. So hopefully for the next presentation, that'll be something that I can bring forward since the inception of the perfect attendance, this is what we've seen and this is kind of where we're at. So I can, but thank you for that question. That's my concern too, is that they're here now, oh, we don't need you now, no, because right. we're, we're gonna need them. We're having a hard time getting them. And then right. we do get them. Absolutely. And then we get them and, you know, like I said, child, How does that affect grading? How does that affect testing? Um, do we track any of that so that we know what kind of impact <coughs> it's, it's causing our kids? We do, and I know that, uh, I'm not sure with the academic side when they presented some data. Um, I know when, I mean, of course for me, I hear it because I'll, it, it's, it's me, right? It's affecting me when I hear, well, we had vacancies last year, and this is kind of why we're, we yielded the results that we did. Um, I know this year even more so when we're looking at it, we're even tracking as far down as if they're in an alt cert program and what type of alternative certification program are they in because then that'll help us when we go recruit if we have teachers that maybe are in the classroom um, but are not doing so well because the preparation program did not do it well and that will help us when we go recruit you know not we're going to shine anybody away but if i have to pick between a texas teachers and a teach worthy and I know Texas teachers programs don't prepare their teachers that well because we're looking at our data and their success rate is not great. But then we're gonna go with a teach-worthy candidate. Um, so there is data there to support more so on the vacancies probably from last year. And this year I know that we've been really, really um, trying to make sure that we can, if there is a vacancy, there is a way that we can spread the kids out so that they're with a certified teacher, then we do that as well to try and support that. Sure. 
So you're, you're tracking data per classroom, per child, that type of thing? Correct. Per teacher. Per teacher. Yes, sir. So I think Mr. Chavez is making a note probably to make sure maybe one of the academic side comes and presents that. That's something yeah. can share with, with the team. Uh, I think I, for just for observations from last year, the last three years actually, uh, teacher absence in a room uh, impacts achievement. Uh, we can have the substitutes there, but content knowledge, getting level, I mean, uh, content knowledge is not, may, may not be there. I don't want to say that. Because some cases we do have substitutes or actually certified teachers, but uh, the, 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 the opportunity for them to learn to their impact. So, so there's like a loss of learning when um, a substitute comes in when the teacher's absent? I wouldn't say a loss of learning, but in terms of learning gain, it may impact that. Uh, if you're in a biology classroom and you're studying something like biochemistry and you're covering a piece and you can't cover it that time, you can't move forward unless the person understands that concept. Are there like um, specific requirements for like teachers when um, a substitute um, comes in? Mm -hmm. Like um, what lessons they have to prepare for? They provide them with lessons, but the lessons, uh, we're not gonna provide a lesson on have that person be required to teach biochemistry. You can give worksheets, you can give readings, uh, but in terms of saying, is there a difference between a teacher present in the classroom and a substitute? The answer to that is yes. And that's, that's in a lot of cases, because we do hear that from sometimes substitutes, and sometimes, I mean, they get lesson plans, and sometimes it's the activity that is given to them. So sometimes, most of the time, I substitute teachers have to prepare at least three lesson plan activities in case of an emergency, right? Yeah. So in case of an emergency, sometimes it may be something that's not, not even related to the subject matter. Um, unless you can get with a department head or a grade level, you know, who can kind of help with that. Um, so there are various situations that we have to kind of analyze to see. So sometimes you may not even be able to get the same topic. So if a teacher's out for a couple of days, the teacher can come back and check that out. Right. What we were referring to for last year, in the last three years, was teachers gone for extended extended period of time. Uh, some of the things that we did is we packed classes. <laughs> I mean, huge classes. Uh, the time that we were doing uh, COVID, we had synchronous and asynchronous learning. We had some teachers covering 300 students. So I, I, the, the quality drops off a tad bit when you start doing that kind of thing. So we did notice that. So, so, so in your opinion, is this, is this you know, a little short? With the budget for supporting this area? Um, no, I think we're good with the budget, kind of where we're at. Um, I think the other factors that are impacting the teacher absences is kind of where, and I think some of these other incentives that we put in place would probably help for some of these teachers that, I mean, it may be just sometimes like, you know what, I'm just going to take a day off. But if they know there's some kind of incentive at the end of the semester, it may not be so likely to just take a day off. Now, sometimes it's out of their control. They get sick or a car accident or something else that they have to be out. But we, I mean, we're good. I think last year our total expenditures for subs was about a 2.1 million that we spent over on subs. And I think right now we're about 860,000. But, but you do have those classrooms where, you know, I mean, you, 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 where you have the majority of those absences. You were able to identify that early on, weren't you? We are. So I'm just wondering if we're budgeted well enough because at the end of the day, you know, this is all about moving children forward. Absolutely. Yes. Sir. So I should move up next. So I think it's really important to to mention that Ms. Elias mentioned a lot of different initiatives, right? Step one was we can't get subs. We've got people out. We have no control over it when people are out. Right. At this point in time last year, I think we looked at it and it was um, an average of 10 to 11 absences per teacher by November. And that might mean that I had a classroom that if my campus app had a permanent sub because we couldn't hire people, right? So there's a lot of different circumstances. But what happens is I then fill the teacher position because I couldn't. Not for lack of time, I couldn't. But Ms. Bendeli made uh, appropriations in the budget based on recommendations to finance a teacher, right? So if I have a permanent sub there, I'm saving money, but our kids aren't getting educated. So you're using those same dollars, to, to your point, we're using those same dollars, they're not separate budgets, 
it's really repurposing the money to fill the gaps that we have. So even the $2.1 million that Ms. Neal mentioned, if we can keep our teachers in the classroom, then we're not paying for a sub. Those monies will be used then to, for the incentive. If you've been here with perfect attendance, the money that I normally would have paid a substitute, I'm gonna repurpose those same dollars again to use them to give the incentive so that you are in the classroom. And when you look at the, bring it full circle now, we're also short in other areas where we've not been able to hire paraprofessionals in some instances. So Mr. Williams has a program right now to train for uh, CDL licenses because we need bus drivers. Ms. Nervino's opening up opportunities at Region 20 so that those people that have been working with us, that want to progress, there's a, a pipeline, if you will, to go to Region 20, now you get your certification to be an aide, perhaps. The next step, if you're really interested in education, we have programs that she talked about last uh, meeting we had, uh, that may put you in a teach-worthy program where you pay for your education for the three or four years if you want to be a classroom teacher. So some of these things, pivoting and turning, the, the same dollars tend to get recycled because we have we budget in one way, it's not working, so it's really stepping back and saying, we're gonna use the same dollar, we need it here now and repurposing to do something else. But at the end of the day, it boils down to the salary and creating an opportunity because what we budget for is that teacher salary. We don't want the substitutes, unless, we don't want to use substitutes unless it's for something like professional development that we're planning for, et cetera. Those are the natural and normal things that we're gonna continue to need substitutes for. We want our teachers to grow. But as far as, is it a financial thing? No, it's more of the need keeps evolving and changing based on the circumstances. So, so we have we have enough money in that bucket to, to, to start making this you know, work a little bit better. Yep. Okay. Okay. Now, I was gonna ask you a question about that. Is that what you, okay. No, okay. that's fine. Oh, okay. So I was gonna ask you about when you have a sub in the classroom, they're not actually teachers, are they just, I guess, supporting the lesson in hopes if they have time it was a planned you know absence and they would have time to let me go print something out so that the kids can work on something tomorrow whether it's a reading and then they answer questions based on the lesson that was introduced maybe the day before so it they, used to be out there two or three days for whatever reason so the sub already knows she, she's got a lesson plan she's going to follow mm -hmm. those cases where you you get hit by a car and you're out for two weeks and trying to get somebody to come in there, you know, you're not ready. Because we have lessons already planned, but not for an extended period of time. I think also, you have a different pay for long-term substitutes. Yes. And so for long-term substitutes, the more pension, you might get a, someone who may be a, a, a former teacher, you know, possibly. So the pay is a little bit less. So, so, so we're planning for stuff like that. Yes, and normally when, if it's something like that, emergency and it's long term that's where the department head comes in you know um, and steps in and says okay now I mean I have as a principal I would go to my department and say look I've got this paper out I need you to help create some lessons because um, maybe a car accident um, so the department head steps in that's one of their duties that they have or a grade level um, teacher as well and, and if, I, and if I may go to the <coughs> so PLC as a professional learning community most of those are set up with the group of teachers that work in a certain grade level or in a department, you know, mostly in secondary department. They are planning together and looking at every kid to know where they are academically. And saying that, if you had an emergency where something happened to a teacher, a teacher normally has a, a, a folder, they would call it a sub folder, with work in in case they're gonna be out just one day, and, they, and, they, and it's at the last minute they're gonna be out, just to have review type work in there, okay? That's one. But in a, a accident type situation, the grade level leader or the uh, or the uh, department leader, like she said, do that PLC work, and where we know we're heading as a department, let's say biology, they they can share lesson plans that this individual teacher has that teaches the same subject matter 
that this teacher is teaching and use that information and work with the sub during PLC time to kind of help them understand how to deliver the information. Not all sub subs may be, like they could be a certified teacher, but they may be a cert certified teacher in math, and then I'm in a biology class, so I may not have that, that, that background and that content information, but I do have a pedagogy and know how to deliver information. So that's, a, that's the PLCs really help too. And it does happen where we're both teaching algebra one and I teach civil science. If I have a long-term teacher and I'm introducing a lesson maybe in three days, I can teach it to my class. And if I know Ms. Pam's class is out, well then that sub that's assigned to Pam can come cover my class while I go introduce the lesson to those students. You know, so I can go in there and teach the class. And so it's just really working together and planning. And that works really well if you have an A-B schedule. Correct. Yes. So let's say something like that does happen for them. Like one teacher's out, but we have another teacher. Like that comes in the same topic. Um, what if it like overwhelms the teacher that they have to like go into another classroom? Like are we like providing an incentive for them also? We did. What we started doing um, last year was those individuals that had extra students is that we were providing them some extra duty pay because after hours that they were having to, you know, maybe help with uh, grading or the building lessons and we were providing them with extra duty pay. Are we still doing that, the extra duty pay? Um, we haven't had a request this year from a principal letting us know that we have individuals that are doing that. Um, so I'm thinking because of the, the lower number of requests, you know, that, that hasn't come you know, to fruition, but it is something the incentive just to give you an update on where we are so over the ratio kind of ties right back into kind of what we we're talking about these were approved and should be paid out in december over the ratio is for those individuals that we normally work on our staffing based on a formula let's say elementary we have 22 to 1. if there is a classroom that has you know 23 you know do we go out and request a new unit right well in most cases probably not right so and in some cases, especially where we are right now, we may not find a certified teacher. So we could open a position, but we may have students that are not gonna have a teacher. So instead, what we did is that over the ratio, if they were having students that were, say those teachers who were supposed to be at 22, if they have one, two, or three over, we, we approved an incentive to pay them $200 per grading period. If they kept you know, one, two, or three students over, and they kept them in their classroom. So again, incentivizing those that are taking the initiative and said, you know what, I'm okay. And that was an option of the teacher. If they said, I'm okay to keep one, two, or three over. Once it became too much, then they could say, you know what, I don't wanna do this. Go ahead and open up and see if we can hire a couple, you know, another teacher. So right now we have seven teachers that will be receiving the over the ratio stipend. And then our enrollment also fluctuates, right? So that is why we were looking at um, keeping the over the ratio, but we're monitoring the daily enrollment so that we know it has to be 50% of the time. So say in one grading period or one six weeks grading period, there are six weeks, three weeks out of those six weeks, they should have been over the 22 to one. And if that's the case, then they receive the $200. So they'll get this payout in December. If they did, right now we have six of the seven that'll get 200, which meant we had six teachers that were one, two or three students over. And we had one teacher who was actually getting um, $600 because that individual did maintain over the racial enrollment for all three grade periods. So they'll be getting $600 in December. Longevity, of course, that's going to be a retention that we've been doing, that uh, we've been approving um, the past couple of years. But what we wanted to do this year is really incentivizing those that have been committing to the district for years, right? So instead of just paying everybody a flat out, you know, 500 or 200, 300, we've given multiple. Now it's let's stagger it and let's cheer for those individuals that you've been here you know, longer than, you know, the average, then we're gonna give you a little bit more, right? So that was the longevity. So that will also be paying out in um, in December. So that's just based on the years of service that they've been here, uh, that's how they'll be paid out. And that's all employees, all full-time employees, I should say. Our buyback program, we have seen, this is our buyback program that we um, just approved. These are individuals that are retiring. We do see retirements, of course, all year long. Uh, but most of them will happen around December or January because they can get a full year's credit if most of them they stay through, Jan through January. Um, so we have, I believe, five, there might have been one more right before I came that was submitting their paperwork. Um, anywhere on average from you know 10 to about 15 days that they're getting that are gonna be paid back. 
where I can see this program really kind of exploding is now that we're providing a perfect attendance incentive, well, now we're asking them not to use their days, so now they're gonna have a lot of days. So when they retire, what happens before we had this program is that individuals, because our policy says you can be out three days before you need a doctor's note, they could go a whole year sometimes because they had so many days, it was take three days, come back for one, take three days, come back for one. So imagine the impact and instruction with that, you know, because individuals were, were really, so providing this buyback program, I think will really help with that, um, to making sure that we have that. So right now, like I said, five, maybe six that I have that we're coming up, we'll probably see a little bit more in June um, that'll get the payout.
this, I believe, will really help us. So we'll see the impacts. So I'm hoping to bring you some data as soon as we get this started. This will start not during the intersection, but on the 9th when we get back. Um, that's when it'll start so we can kind of see how that's impacting. And then I'll, again, we're looking at how many subs, but we're also going to look at the impact on academics. You know, because we're hoping having more teachers in the classroom will definitely help our, uh, our sports as well. Oh, sorry, yes, sir. So these type of stipends are different than um, our other stipends that we have posted online, like um, for like after school, like teachers, like coaches, and after school activities. Yes, these are in addition to. Yes, sir. So, so social emotional support. Um, just wanted to give you a real brief uh, analysis on how we have this uh, assigned to the campuses. So currently right now at the elementary campuses, we have one social worker per campus that is assigned to the elementary campus, except Gardendale. Gardendale has um, their own plan with the city of San Antonio. So we don't uh, provide a social worker to Gardendale. They provide it through the city of San Antonio, but they do have social support through the city of San Antonio that is provided. At our secondary level, instead of having a social worker, we provide an SEO counselor, right? So, that individual goes in and supports the students. Most of the time you have your core academic counselors and then you have your social emotional support. We also have our collaboratives that we have that we've had for the past four years uh, where individuals can be referred um, and they get assistance that way. Um, we also just approved one through Bear County. That's a new initiative that we have as well that is also be providing. Uh, we have communities and schools at JFK and at Memorial. Um, the only one that does not have an SEO counselor assigned to them at the secondary campus will be the Fine Arts Academy. Of course, we look at our enrollment and we look at the number of students, you know, based on, on needs. We do have our lead social worker that is assigned to Roosevelt, and she goes and provides support um, to our Fine Arts Academy when needed. Um, and of course, we have our uh, director and our coordinator that are also assigned that can go and provide support. But this is really um, a big need, I believe, for our students. Um, so I know that the collaborative will really help us in that, to making sure that we have that, and really just trying to get that information out. Because we do have an employee assistance program for our employees, but if we're seeing some of our employees are struggling, I know that our students are as well. Uh, and these initiatives that we have are not only just for our students, but they're for our employees as well. So these collaboratives, so I can see that that will help. I don't know if there was any questions on this. Yes, sir. Uh, so the social emotional learning, I know when I was in high school, we had like curriculum, like in the beginning of the day, do you still have that? They, I know that that's when they had a certain time frame that they were supporting, um, and I believe that is still in place. <coughs> I believe that is the end of mine, and I'm gonna turn it over to now who provides all the finances for these supports. <laughs> never ending but the <laughs> All right, good afternoon. So I'm going to kind of cover um, the responsibility of the board, what funds the board is required to approve, kind of our account code structure. We're going to talk a little bit about our audit that we just completed and was accepted by the board in November. And then I've provided a glossary of terms because in the finance, we seem to have a lot of terms. So anyway, provided that for your review, and then we'll take a quick look at our upcoming budget calendar. So board responsibility. The board has really three responsibilities. They set policy, they hire the superintendent, and they have the responsibility for adopting the annual budget. And the annual budget must be adopted by June for our district because we are a July through June school year. So by the end of June, we have to have a budget adopted for the next school year. All right, so along with the board responsibility of adopting the budget, there are three funds that the board is responsible for adopting. So you adopt the general fund, you adopt the food service, sometimes we refer to the food service as child nutrition, and the debt service fund, or sometimes we refer to it as interest in sinking. So the general fund, what is it? The general fund is the fund that has our instructional services, administration, transportation, PTS, 
and technology. And most revenues are generated from our property taxes, our state formula um, from obviously the state that's on your attendance and a lot of those type things. A little bit comes from gate receipts, indirect costs, also something that is not up there is our interest earnings. You know, in the, in the past few years, interest earnings haven't been a lot, but right now they're starting to look a little nicer, so I wanted to be sure and point those out. Interest on our investments, like we've got uh, X number of amounts of millions of dollars in the bank and we earn interest on it. <clears throat> All right, so food service or child nutrition. It includes the cost of operating all the cafeterias and any caterings. And the, food, the funds come from our National School Breakfast Lunch Program, which are considered federal funds our a la carte sales and catering. You'll notice, I believe, at our meeting that we did in, um, well, we, did, we were in October, Mr. Williams covered in pretty great detail all the different programs that the child nutrition and food service programs were involved in. All those revenues go into this fund. Our debt service or your interest in sinking this is where we pay for our principal and interest on our bonds. So when the district gets ready to build a building, we sell bonds. So, and then we get all the money in so we can build, Mr. Williams can get all his stuff built, but then we have to pay for that over a long period of time. So this is the fund that takes care of paying that. We pay the principal back and then we pay interest on that money. But where do we generate the funds from that? to pay to make those payments is we generate those from property taxes and also the state has a fund that they also contribute to the district to help make those payments. And we have to apply to that at the time we do the bond. Yes, sir. Explain the function of a bond. The function <coughs> of the bond? Yeah, what is the bond? Exactly? Well, we'll sell bonds to, uh, there's maintenance tax notes, so I believe the district has a maintenance tax note that they maybe three or four years ago about five years ago and that one was combined a bunch of larger maintenance pro projects that really there wasn't money in the general fund to cover now the regular bond is if you want to build a new building then you're going to go through you know getting your architect you know doing all that due diligence then you go to the voters to approve the bond so if you want to build um, let's say a new elementary and you go through getting your architect, you get your estimated price, you have meetings with all the, the taxpayers, the community, you know, explaining why you need the bond. Then it goes to the voters. The voters either approve or deny the bond. If the bond is approved, then you use your financial advisor, you sell the bonds, get the money in, and it, it, the, when the money comes in, it does not go into this fund it will go into a capital projects fund. And then that's where you maintain and pay the cost to build the building. Any questions on how that process went? I was hearing, um, I was reading like an article and saying that the, the state for that fund they said, um, that the state provides that it's like, it's already almost reaching the maximum, right? I don't know. I did, but our application has already been in, and I mean, they've already, at the time we sold the bonds, they were gonna pay a certain percentage for us. And do you know when we'll be done like paying the bonds? In about 10 to 11 years, we will have 100% of the bonds paid. And, um, I think it's 2033. Like those bonds, um, the latest ones were only built faster than where she said it was Well, I'm not positive because we have refunded a lot of them. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about refunding on a couple of slides on down. So I can't really, I don't know exactly when those were built. Okay, so we'll, we'll get to the refunding in a little bit. That is the, the you might be the last month of bond proceeds was the Van Paul Act thing because with the last two new campuses, yes, were the ones you mentioned. I have one more question. Um, going back to the food service, Absolutely. Uh, I know um, when uh, we have our meetings, like with the superintendent and um, the staff, uh, we bring like pizza and um, like um, 
experience? Um, does that money come from the food service office? Like as catering? If we purchase it, if we purchase it from our own child nutrition, then that would be a catering for them. Now, if we purchase like today's meal from Jason's Deli, doesn't have anything to do with the food service. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. That has been very specific to our students who live in federal monies. We cannot take money from that fund to pay for an adult fund unless we pay it back. So oh. we, we can't use their money. We would have to take monies from our operating fund to pay for the catering, and they provide us a service. We can't use the money they're generating for the students to pay for a meal for us. Oh, so like when we went to, uh, I remember the last one was they went to a um, What's that street? Uh, Brentwood, and we use it from like the general fund, like for the like, the lunch, yeah, the yeah. pizza. Uh, yeah, well, we, we we kind of do, but we need we pay it back. We can't take from food services even when they have. And Mr. Williams mentioned at the last meeting that we have an excess fund balance. We've got to gain from being efficient, right? Uh, even though they have extra money, we can't use that money for any other purpose except to support the student meals and that program. So we can siphon off any money, um, no matter how legitimate, to do something other than support the student meals. So I mean, we can hire food service to cater a meal, but then the general fund's gonna write a check to the food service fund. Yes. Okay. And I mean, the same thing is while we're talking about food and catering, that's the same way if we use the Memorial High School Culinary Arts to cater something. We pay them for that service. So that helps them generate funds to do things. So then are, like that, the funds would stay in the district, right? Or? Those funds stay with that group so that they can go and do things with the funds that they generate. So it helps them maybe if they have um, Barbecue competition. Yeah, barbecue competition that they want to go to. It helps them cover those costs. So, like, that would be better, like, um, if we're having, like, something with the students, um, like, use the resources that we have instead of, like, buying pizza outside and serving. Yes, but a lot of times with food service, you know, we, we were using them uh, for caterings, but unfortunately, a lot of times they're short staffed. And um, I know, you know, they started out the year, but as the teachers have left, so have they. And so if they have the extra staff and they can do it, we would love for them to do it, but their first priority is feeding the students. And that usually is our first pass. We want the students <coughs> to, to use and showcase our students, but we also have to be really, really considerate of schedules. Like we, want, we wouldn't want to pull out a student right now, have, it, and have them cater, but they're scheduled to uh, be there at 12 for their class, and we need them at 11. We also need, need to be really cognizant that we can't just pull them for some of these events because it doesn't fit with the academic schedule. So that's always our, our, we try to make that our first pass. It doesn't always work out just because of scheduling conflicts or uh, the priorities being wide upon for sale. They've been at a Plática. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, the, the Quinones and Plática, they have different venues, right? I mean, very good food, very good. Mm -hmm. And so it happens to be what they're working on in the class. All right. Did we kind of cover debt service and interest and thinking we're kind of good with that? Okay. All right. So back to the board responsibility. Now this is specifically board responsibility on adopting the budget. So in a minute I'll show you a slide that shows what our account number is that we deal with day in and day out. Each one of those has a purpose and means something especially when we submit teams. That's another thing that teams wants it in that detail. But the board's responsibility is to approve it at the fund function level. So general fund, then we have all those functions, and then you have your food service and debt service. So this is that long account code structure that we deal with, and they'll call and ask us for an account number for something, and we've done it so long we rattle off the account number, and they're all looking at us like, wait, wait, I'm still at fund. So, okay. Anyway, so the one circled in green is the fund, and the one next to it is the function. That is the level that the school board approves. All right, so with the, I'm going to kind of switch and go into our audit that y'all approved in November. So I don't know if you've had a lot of time to go through it and look, but there was a lot more information, especially 
especially historical information than we have provided in years past. So we were looking at the, this particular one about the 10 year historical revenue by source. So this is starting in 2013 and going through uh, 2022. So what do you see? I mean, we, in 2013, we had 130.1 million. In 2022, we had 134.4 million dollars in revenue. And this is all three of the funds that the board approves. It's general fund, food service, and debt service. I've color coded them. So what, what stands out? kind of switching, isn't it? Yeah. Um, we're receiving less local, I mean less state. We're utilizing more federal, but also what's happening down here with the orange one? It's kind of staying the same, I guess, because like there hasn't been huge development in a while. Well, is it kind of staying the same or is it kind oh, of creeping yeah. up? Creeping up. Yeah, like for the past like three years, it's kind of so when we put this together, I don't know if back, I don't know if y'all remember like the legislative session in 2019. There, they made a lot of changes to school funding and school finance out of House Bill 3 in 2019. So that started having an impact in 2020. So House Bill 3, they were having tax compression. They want the state legislative session wants the taxpayers to carry less of the burden and that the state's gonna pick up more of the burden. But, doesn't really look like it. But also have to remember we're in a declining enrollment during this time period as well. But part of House Bill 3 is, you know, district you're used to getting I'm just gonna say $100 million to operate your school between your property taxes and your state funding. That's all you're gonna get going forward. You know, of course it's gonna go down as your enrollment goes down, <coughs> but there's not gonna be new money going into school finance. So that's why you start to see the shift between the state and local you're still only going to get the same amount of pie so if our property tax is going to generate 20 percent of our funding then the state kicks in 80. if it's going to generate 25 percent of our funding then the state's only going to kick in 75. they're not ever going to get you to where you're over and our example was 100 million dollars and also, you know, you've had ESSER kick in here. And, you know, we've done some very uh, purposeful, purposeful things with ESSER, especially, you know, with COVID and uh, maintaining teachers. We kept teachers on staff uh, during that time period. So anything else? revenue this has federal this has everything this little gray bar would be like your interest earnings your gate receipts your chars but no they're they have their their formula where you get six thousand one hundred sixty dollars for a basic student okay. that's not a special education student it's not a student in career technology that but let's just say the basic student we should earn six thousand one hundred and sixty dollars for that student if that student is in the chair every day that we're in school. That's not a great thing that we do. Yes, but if that student is misses 10% of the time, they're gonna take 10% off my 6160. Yeah. 
That's why I'm always talking about attendance. We need the kids here. Yeah. Yes, sir. And I believe um, for this ADA's legislative session, there has been some bills filed, right, to increase the parent allotment for students? They have, and then that's going to bring some new challenges as well, because back as part of House Bill 3, when they did increase the basic, basic allotment, 30% of that increase had to go to teacher salaries. So now they're, they're bringing that back up again, so we're going to have to remember that what they do bring up then we're gonna to have to reserve the 30% and we have to make sure that we funnel that to the teachers. So you look at what we already pay the teachers, then they're gonna get a 30% more. So you have, that's, you know, yes, it's gonna help us <coughs> with teachers and stuff, but it's not just gonna be money that we can do what we want to with. It is gonna come with some strength. Is there also thinking about um, some of the bills um, Instead of like the attendance of for how many students are enrolled, <laughs> that would be a lot nice if they would pay on enrollment. Yeah. Because you know when we have a classroom, I can't say well your your kids your students come ninety percent of the time, so I'm only going to give you ninety percent of the te the desk ninety percent of the textbooks. You can't. You have to staff and have supplies and everything for every child that's enrolled, even if the child only comes 50% of the time. So you have to prepare for every child, but we only get paid for that student and the amount of time he's in the chair. It, it's also different um, when like, um, someone comes from a charter district, like the money won't come with them until like the next school year. Mm, no, I don't think so. I mean, once the kid is enrolled in our school and he's attending, we get funds on that student. So. That's based on our yeah. metrics. That's a consideration I was just receiving. So you may be referring to because there's three key legis legislative actions that are going to impact us significantly. Uh, <coughs> you already mentioned one of the enrollment versus ADA. We can get paid on enrollment. That would be fantastic. Uh, the vertical allotment increase. The third one is the voucher system. And, um, opening up borders and choice for need to work on retaining students that are in the district and have chosen to go outside of the district. Um, and then we have the partners that we also, now we have partnerships, right, as part of your application process. When our board approved these applications and we got the recommendations to the board, there was a plan to increase enrollment every year. So that's a three-pronged thing that we're addressing what are the targets? We have 347. The target was to have, and we, I don't know that our targets intentionally were to attract 500 students from outside of the district, but our targets were to increase enrollment by certain percentages, particularly when we went out with, for the 1882 partnerships. So those are the things. Go ahead, sir. 
No, no, no. So, so, so what you're saying is we know we're going to lose to win. So, you know, because, because you know, we, we won. There's, there's less and less fa young families in the, in yes, the community. Yes, the birth rate. So we're, we're, we're going we're gonna to lose kids. So, so I'm sure there's guesstimates that we could have on that. Yes. And if you know you're going to lose that, but your goal is to increase enrollment. How do you make it that distance? Then, then you need to have that number so you know how many you need to attract and, and yes. make that number a positive, a positive outcome. Absolutely. I, I would think that that would be critical. To, and know, we still have a really good opportunity to win right here. That. We looked at that about four years ago, actually three years ago, uh, and we had approximately 2,700 students who should have been in mm -hmm. here. And we had about 718 that actually went to one of these campuses down the road, and uh, I think 900 at another campus. So, and that was over time, we did a study of kids in K through 12, how many of those students either started or should, should be enrolled in place. So that was, that was that was the hypothesis, how many students do yeah. And we came up with that number. So we have students who are in the district that aren't in our schools. And of course, the outside, we're, we're actually gonna re recreate that number because we're looking at what, how many students now after COVID are out. I, I, I don't know, but I, I suspect it's gonna be higher, uh, but we don't know where they're going. So that's the one thing that we were doing in the process of now working on with our teams, our, our SIS, to see what kids have gone, where they've gone, where they're going to, where they're coming from, and then how many in the district that should be in the district that are not. And the goals inside the contract, for every operating partner, they set goals of the number of students that they project over time. The two years for COVID was was not a good, a good tracking time for them. Right, right. Did you bring that back to January? Yeah, I plan to do it now. I put it on my notes for it. Yes. I was gonna say, no, we're also like getting um, more enrollment for like um, the Garden Mill School, right? And no? Um, I, I just was looking at that today. Uh, currently, and I'm also doing this, choose a little simple. They're currently at an enrollment of 211. Uh, their previous enrollment was about 441. And uh, when we had our school there, when we were dropping off there, our school there, they have a capacity of 564 students. So our goal is to start increasing these numbers. So they have room to grow. Uh, all of our campuses have room to grow. It's just a matter of getting out there and attracting we're going to generate this list so we can go and start actively recruiting them in January. I mean, like actively calling, you know, sending out things. That they may not like us for doing that, but we're going to do that. <laughs> so no, I did a good job last time you all were recruiting. Mm -hmm. I remember you were there when you were there. Yeah, yeah, we, we've got the means to do that. Uh, and we need to know who we're at now. We can go out and broadcast that, but I think we can be more strategic about which families probably shifting some, some monies in the budget for you know, uh, marketing. And, and we're, we're spending pretty heavily in marketing this year. We had a pretty hefty budget in marketing this year. We increased it, I am not say significantly for this year, this current school year. <coughs> Going back to what uh, you were saying, Ms. Martinez, attracting from outside into the district or from the district that left, and then what was the third one? Oh, with the, the partnership semester, I was mentioning. Also, uh, there are students. There are always going to be our students. But we also went into partnerships so that they could bring some benefit to the, the table, right, to improve multiple things. But among those things was also attracting the students and helping us with those recruiting efforts through their resources. Oh. So we have a, a three-pronged, uh, and actually we just had a conversation this last week yeah, about what everybody bringing to the table because definitely there are students. Part of the onus is on us. We, we have not handed the building to anybody. But we also were very specific about some of the targets and what some of the expectations were, and that included increasing enrollment at the different campuses. Several 
of our small by design, uh, two classrooms at every grade level. Uh, but there should be opportunities because we have capacity in the buildings to bring in the third, fourth, even a fifth classroom when we should have a pre-K two in, in the case of Delta. So there's opportunities for growth. Uh, and those conversations, the side we have with the partners. Now we're, we've gone through, here's a project we've launched. Now, where are we with the metrics? We're year three. Like that's when we said we're gonna evaluate this. It's year three. What do we look like? Did we really get what we were we thought we were gonna get? And what tweaks do we need to make moving forward? So Ms. Adrian's is already working on some of those pieces as well. Okay. I just have one other question for mm -hmm. um, if, if if this fund continues and you know we're we're uh, losing more and more kids, and, you know, we may have to close some schools. That is an option because actually there was, when we first started the innovation, uh, we worked, remember Duncan? Mm -hmm. Duncan Kreisman, he's our advisor that we've worked with in innovation, and she's working with Diversa. Uh, we actually ran a, a school in Aldi that was yes and it and, uh, and, and the campus and the district. So they had three individuals in the co-locating in that one campus. I believe it was a high school. It started off really rocky, but it, you know, it's still up and running today. So, yeah, buildings are, are a big issue for charters. That's that's the biggest expense, and that's why we're able to start them with partners because we have the buildings. Uh, but that that would be a, a we we chatted about that because the funding the funding would be you know significantly increased because they have access to monies that we don't have access to. Yeah, their 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 summary of finances. They they get a lot more money per student just by the nature of being a charter. Might, might be a thought. We also have those charters in our district boundaries, right? Like Kip, Kip, an idea. Yeah. And then the one on Fort. Promesa, Promise. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's also just for relevance. took that off of the table this last like this little section we talked about buildings and we're talking about bonds but just for context last legislative session the legislative actions made available to charters monies to create or to, to build their own building they didn't have to go through an election process but they did match some of the, their funds to create or to build brand new buildings that opportunity at the last session was not afforded to school so while two years ago, and so this next legislative session, right, depending on what monies are available for expansion, that may very well be an option for us to put on the table. But if the legislature decides to match funding for new buildings, and what we have to offer is a facility that they're gonna rent, have to come in, massive, do massive amount of renovation, and I don't have money to match that. So if I even have a 50% contribution from the state to build a brand new building and coming into a facility that's aged and may need a lot of um, uh, monies to bring it up to par and I'm not getting any funding so my dollar here is going to get me in a new building is going to get me um, much better return than sinking it into a building that's aging that I might have to do repairs so that option Mr. Sofa is really going to be contingent on what options they have available they meaning the chargers are going to have available for their expansion projects moving into the future. So depending on what the legislature does to allocate or not allocate funds, that's gonna, that may give us a lot of leverage if the funds are indeed running out and they're not gonna do matching anymore. And with that example, I mean, you're saying it's cheaper for them to leverage one of our buildings and rebuild one? Potentially, depending on the land or not, or just go find something else. If they, that, it's that location, be, it's location. Part of the location. Yeah, I think you were when we went to uh, what you know, we, we mm -hmm. sold what they, they still have mm -hmm. the building there. Yes. Their biggest 
Maybe it's I south. Not <coughs> that level Demolition of that building. I think they wanted to, they're like having a conversation about preserving the Lincoln Elementary School now. Yeah, they had, uh, they actually, when we were planning that whole Let's Eat part, that new addition, they talked about having inside the new addition a, a location to kind of pay homage to the, the, uh, the, uh, the history of, uh, of that particular school. And uh, yeah, I think now they're, <laughs> they're at a point for doing that. But there's a lot of renovations that have to happen to that building. Do you know what ribbon cutting in January, right? I don't know. I, I talked to Jean, Jean, Jean uh, when you were here the other night. Do you know if they'll keep the plaque that says Lincoln Elementary? Oh, I don't know. That's there? That's there. So why is the little gray bar less now? You mentioned it was several things, right? Well, a lot of it is our interest earnings on our investments. Oh. Remember here in the last couple of years, it's been like 0.09%. Of course, now right now it's it's nice, and mm -hmm. we're going to keep maximizing that to the best we can. Um, and a lot of that's kind of gate receipts. So of course, you know, COVID, we weren't able to have sporting events, yeah. that type of thing. Also, SHARS goes in there, our school health and related services. Um, and that's kind of declining a little bit as well. All right, so we've talked a lot already kind of about House Bill 3 from the 2019 legislature. Mm -hmm. But I wanted you to see what the tax compression has looked like. So in 2020, we adopted a dollar six, and this is just your maintenance and operations tax. So that's not debt service. You adopt two different rates. You adopt a maintenance and operation rate, and you adopt a debt service or interest and sinking rate. So you can see that over the last three years that the maintenance and operations tax note has gone down and it will continue to go down. They're still talking about tax compression and the rate's gonna go down. You can see the interest in sinking was the same for two years and this last year it went down about two cents and a lot of that was the refunding of the bonds. In addition to, we'll see, like, well we can see it here also on our uh, assessed value. So this is the assessed value of what we're generating these pennies on. So that would be, this is per $100 value of what we are generating. So you can also see what the values have done in a 10 year period. They're a billion dollars more in a, in a 10 year period. Even though the taxes have gone down and we talk about it, like you said, the $100,000 valuation, our tax payers, even though that when they talk about the legislature talks about tax relief, because this number, the assessed value, keeps creeping up, our taxpayers don't really, it, it could be a lot worse, but our taxpayers aren't really seeing the relief just because those property values have spiked up so much. Mm -hmm. Right, so that, that's really important because it, the taxpayers aren't getting the relief we thought they were going to get. Right, so. No, we're not getting it. No. <laughs> I know my house keeps getting older and it keeps, yes sir, more, more money. I was asked this question uh, in my new community. I don't know how the subject came up about the GMB businesses in our district. Who, who determines the tax break for business in our district? I do not answer that question. I mean, I, I think the board is the only one Yeah. So 
guys have a Section 8 exemption. And so those, you don't have any control over. But the first petition goes to the city, then it comes to the board if absolutely required. But not all of it requires absolutely. Some of the tax rates have to come from the city, not from the school district. So it really depends on, on what they're trying to do. You don't have the authority. The board doesn't have the authority to exempt them from all the taxes. Right? So it would be what we were going to do mm -hmm. with our tax. And the state comptroller gets involved in that as mm -hmm. well. I've been had that in my uh, previous district, especially with the solar farms. They always want a, an abatement on their tax for so many years. Uh, and I would think it would be very similar. And, ju and just as a huge point of reference, because if we think something to avoid, and always keep this in mind, if we think something to avoid to abate someone's taxes or reduce taxes, give any type of tax incentive the state calculates our taxes like when we do homesteads right you just take we don't have an additional homestead exemption their district let's say we're gonna uh, do a hundred thousand dollar exemption that's above what the state requires right anything that we do in that kind of debt forgiveness the state counts us as you could have collected another million dollars and you chose not to Right, so going back to those blue versus the, the the state versus the local funding. So if we could have collected X amount of dollars and we chose not to, the state counts it as you could have collected it, you didn't. We're not gonna make up that thousand dollars. That's why the controller gets involved. So that's like a penalty. It is. And it, now and I'm not saying that's a necessarily a bad thing, if you're getting other benefits. So when you when you're approached about things like that, there's pros and cons to all that because you think economy, right? It can bring in jobs, it can bring in students, it can bring, that's absolutely true. When we look at that, it's just a, it's a calculation as far as do, does the benefit outweigh the cost? Because we will get penalized at the other end. So in a lot of times the benefit will outweigh the cost, right? But it's just a process that you have to go through. It's not just grab the exception we're gonna get X, Y, and Z. There's that other part of the state that's saying, well, we could have done that and you did we're not gonna subsidize that million dollars. Because again, they're trying to keep us at a certain level of funding, whether it comes from local or state. And if we forego some of our income, they're not gonna throw it in from their bucket. So just something to keep in mind. So I guess my answer would be, to me the district don't control, like going over, we don't control if they pay taxes or not. Or the board the would control what EISD would tax. That, that's the only thing you would have control over. Bear County is still going to tax them, the city, and that type thing. You okay. can only control, the board can only control what you want or to do. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Once it goes right. to Thanks. the board. Yeah, okay. once it goes, you know, up for a vote and you look at the, the pros and cons. Of it. No, no benefit for sure. <laughs> Bottom line. <laughs> no, the state's going to make sure. I mean, they're going to cover themselves. All right, so this one we have been spending time talking about, you know, what is our amount of bonds that we have outstanding. Um, and, you know, we talked about that in 2033 they would be completely paid off. But if you'll look here, this this is was our reserve or our fund balance at the end of 2021. And you notice at the end of 2022, we're down significantly. But remember, we refunded those bonds. So you also see pretty good difference in the amount of bonds that were outstanding. So we took from one bucket to put over there, and then when we also refunded, we got better interest rates. I mean, I'm thinking about all these districts now that have gone out for, you know, a $600 million bond, and I'm thinking, oh, they're, they're going to sell it, and what are interest rates right now? You know? Um, I think when we refunded, it was a good time and we've got really good rates and make it easy to, to get it paid down. So that, that bond money was paid back all the way to 2013? That was the original amount? No, not the original amount. 2013, that was the amount that was on the books so in 2013. But we refunded them a couple of different times throughout that period. So all we owe now on the bond is Money and then like how much are we worth and like 
No. The investors do that. But when we sell it, we get our money, and we're able to do what we said we were going to do with the bond, whether it's build a new elementary or whatever. And then we're just making payments. It's like you go buy the car, and now you got to pay for the car. So right now, we're paying for the car. So we'll pay your, the principal, then we're going to pay interest. And um, do bonds um, raise property taxes? Yes. Yeah, I mean. Yes. That's why you're still talking to the board. Yeah. I mean, that's why I'm here. So if we went out for a $100 million bond right now, based on our current uh, taxable value, our tax rate would go up about 27 cents added to that. For every $100? Yes, for $100 valuation, yes. But, you know, you have $100 million to go do what, what you can get for $100 million nowadays. But the state would pick up probably about 7 cents of that 27 cents. So then the tax rate would be about 40, 40 cents per hundred dollar valuation. And that'll be like over 30 years, right? So probably we'll have to pay. Well, when you set this rate here, by law, you can set whatever rate you need to, to cover the bond payments for that next year. By law, you can do that because the voters have already come out and said, I approve that bond. So. Now you have to be able to make your payments. So if this starts really going down, then this is going to go up because you have to make your bond payments. Okay? All right. So property taxes, levies, collections. So during the board uh, budget process, the board adopts in June, it'll be a proposed tax rate. And then, given some different things, we might come back in September and have to change it, but so far we have not had to. But once you set your tax rate, the appraisal district has done their appraising, that kind of thing, then they send out statements, then you start collecting. So as of June 30th, look at our collection rate. We're right under 92% collection rate. So look at the previous nine years above that. It's the lowest in 10 years. And that's as of June 30th. <clears throat> so again, that kind of goes back to our economy right now. You know, so we also have to keep this in mind when we're spending money in our cash flow because less money is coming in than we thought was going to be coming in. And that also affects this. So this is why you're going to keep a reserve here. Because even if the money's not coming in, we still have an obligation to pay our debts. Okay. All right. So here are just kind of our glossary of terms y'all can read over, especially if I've said something that maybe you weren't sure exactly what it was, y'all can review over those. And so now, you know, our cycle was kind of complete in November. You know, we had worked all year, adopted a budget, and now in October we did the first report. November you approved the audit, and so now we're gonna start the process again. So we're gonna start, um, we've already started, especially uh, HR has been reviewing staffing, etc. cetera. Um, we'll really start ramping it up in January to um, start giving information to the campuses, their allocations, uh, campus staff meetings, um, and we're that's what we're gonna do up through June. June, we're gonna adopt a budget. Um, then August, this is that compressed tax rate, and then that'll determine whether we have to come back to make an adjustment to our tax rate in September, because we, we've not had to do so. I think that's all that I have. Any questions? Sorry about that. Any questions? All right. Well, thank y'all. Thank you. Look forward to the next class. six months. <laughs> you? Wait, I did have one question. Yes, sir. Uh, so um, the next we'll have a new budget cycle, right? Uh, will there like be an increase in like the budget? Don't know that yet. It depends on staffing, which is a, a large component of our budget. Um, but the main thing is it's going to start 
with our estimated revenue. We'll start looking, you know, based on what our values, what we anticipate our values to be, what the maximum rate that we can adopt is. And we're gonna start with revenues and we're gonna try real hard to live within our means. There's also been some very, this, this is the scare right here, is because all of these federal dollars mainly the ESSA. But Pam and her team have done a great job in also working with the fine balance to where we're socking money away, knowing that this was gonna happen so that we have like at least a year or two to maintain some of the initiatives that Mr. Nino talked about, Mr. Williams and what we do, Mr. Uh, Greathouse, some of the things that we're doing to support academics. We can't just blow it up and do all these things and be ready to, to just let go, right? So as we move forward, it's gonna be really important how we can maintain, and, and there, there's been a lot of intentionality over the last couple of years to make sure that there's some reserves in the fund balance that we can use for at least a year or two to get us out of this COVID funk. And we can keep addressing things like the uh, social emotional learning to make sure we can continue honoring the 1882 partnerships that we said we were gonna keep and uh, adding to those will be. And also maintaining programs like um, our coaches. We have a lot of turnover with teachers, so we need the coaches to keep addressing uh, the growth for our, our, our um, teachers to be able to be effective in the classroom with our students. So some of those things, we may not be able to balance budget, but we've intentionally left some monies behind so that we can maintain at least for the next year or two and give us give us and our students and our, our teachers a running start going into the next few years. So that's gonna be interesting. And then it's the legislative year. That's always interesting too. So just some really quick connections. Um, last month, Ms. Bazaldua presented on, on data sweep, right? Ms. Benedi's already talking to you about budget. If no sooner do you adopt one and approve the audit that we're talking about moving into next year. And we're, we're trying to accelerate all those timelines so we can have really good conversations about what that means. So Ms. Batadua talked about that on data suite. That's one of the, just one of the things that we use to keep a pulse on things like attendance, enrollment, giving campuses the access to be able to review their own data so that they can also help us figure out what the gaps are and not wait for us to send out a paper report. So some of the systems process that we, we've been talking about over the last, com, uh, last couple of years, this is the culmination of all that, is giving people real-time information. Um, and that's gonna affect how the data's rolled out as well, right? So uh, Dr. Silva talked about assessment strategies and online testing. Mr. Chavez also spoke about, uh, spoke about M class for reading, measuring student progress, right? Mr. Greathouse comes right back in and says, you know what, we need keyboards for iPads. Our kids shouldn't be touching a keyboard for the first time in third grade, right? So doing some backwards designing in what gaps we had and coming in to fill those gaps. That's a constant process that we go through, right? And he's, um, you already, they, they need to have an idea by the time they get in third grade, how to do some of these things. No matter how good that this is, that's a better strategy, right? And Dr. Silva talked about campus visits and classrooms. Go visit teachers that are doing well. Those pockets of excellence. Well, what does that do? It costs us some substitute money, right? So some of these things aren't gonna go away to your point, Mr. Soka, earlier. It was a great question. But we try to take some of these resources and say, okay, we don't have this, or this isn't working, it's not effective, right? What do we start, stop, or revise? That's part of the ongoing process that, and, and the, the vision that we do, and we're starting to get really better at it. Um, coming and bringing it into the group to SLT so we're not making decisions in silos. It, it's been progress and it, it's been implementing systems like Frontline to be able to, to have real-time information. So all those things are, are starting to come together for us. <clears throat> Next steps in pretty much all of these we talked about, I'm just gonna really quickly. Um, for next year, snapshot, Enrollment is what we normally use to start conversations, right? Ms. Bendeley will look at, at the finance of what those allocations are for next year so that in January, she's already providing campuses especially an idea of what their budget's gonna look like next year so that they have three months to plan. 
then Ms. Uh, Trevino has started back in November going back with campuses to say, okay, here's where I think you're gonna be next year. I'm gonna give you your allocations in February. You can tell me what is or isn't working on the campus. To include how many teachers might be on a growth plan that we need to support a little bit differently, right? Those metrics and going back to review some of the information. So she's already started that back in January, in November rather. So when we come to contract uh, renewals, it's not a surprise, right? Those are things that, that we, we um, start to monitor early. Then um, Mr. Greyhouse already told you he's deployed 2,000, but the target is that by December, we should have near 5,000 of the Chromebooks deployed district-wide. So th those are all things that are happening simultaneously. And Mr. Williams, as he mentioned, by January, he'll have the campus walks completed. And then that next phase starts as far as now in the campus walks with the principal and or partners, just to be clear. That then comes in the next phase. What monies do we have available, tying in the resources to make some of these projects happen? And then we have coming up on December the 12th, it's pretty much as soon as we get back, we have a board workshop at 9 a.m. And then on in January, I wanted to note that I had originally said 13th, I crossed that out. When we printed your presentations, because we in our sets to do this early, we had not finalized the 20th as a date. The date is finalized, so on your presentations, if you take it with you, please make that correction. I can promise you that yours says the 13th. It really should be the 20th that we will have that next leadership board performance plan meeting. And then on the 17th, we have our regular board meeting at the DCC. Same time unless something happens between here and then. But that's what we have for you today. I know we're up on time. Thank you uh, for your patience. So if there are any additional questions that we can answer right now. Workshop is at 8.30? Okay, well there you go. Online. Okay. Oh, here's that 8.30? 8.30. Okay. Now I'm, I'm gonna say something that, because the 10, 10 years that information has been to be presented, that's in your financial statements, so copy that, that big fat book that everybody was just really anxious to read through. That, that, there's a lot of work that goes into that audit and to put 10 years of data together so thank you for that. Um, we had a solid opinion from the auditors with no findings. Now, uh, I will tell you that TEA for the last three or four years, uh, Mr. Paul Moreno, I know him by name already, loves to find a couple of little things, um, but they are, they're reviewing our data, our, our numbers are solid, and they usually come back with something like, the TRS contribution is reduced your uh, net assets, and therefore you're, you need to monitor. That didn't happen this year either, but that's some, some of the things that we can dig on are out of our control completely, but uh, thank you, Ms. Bender, for that. They have great cookies. Yeah, they have fun. <laughs> so that's, I wasn't trying to say that, but yes. <laughs> we'll get a letter, no matter what. Uh, so, anything else? Thank you all. Thank really you. appreciate the time. <laughs>